Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody is off to an unbelievable start. Well, shoot, it's Thursday. Hope you're winding down your week on a positive note. Uh, look, um, before I get started, uh, by now you know, but I'm going to remind you, if you believe in the work we're doing, go to the description box right now, click the link and show your love whether you give via the organization's cash app handle give directly through the organization's own processing uh link or if you give through our gofundme whatever you do support the work we do it is so prevalent um and necessary uh anyway uh those of you who are sports fans definitely basketball fans right now you know and we're in the middle of the um, let me get this over here. We're in the middle of the uh, basketball championship playoffs, NBA playoffs, and um, some crazy things happening. Uh, low seeded teams are giving the business to high seeded teams, and uh, a lot is happening. Um, while I am a huge fan, I don't do a lot of talking about sports online. Um, I hang out with my guys, we talk it. Uh, but I normally save this space for the things I'm passionate about in the sense of making other people's lives better. So if I don't have a teaching point, I generally don't get on here and talk teams and stuff like that. And while I love the sport, uh, I don't consider myself a fan as in fanatic. So I don't lose my mind whether somebody wins or whether somebody loses. I have a, t I have a favorite team. I have two favorite teams, the Lakers and the Warriors. They win, they lose. Good, bad. Don't get excited. Uh, it has very little impact on my personal life and on my personal performance. But when I see situations and it reflects life and I can see how it can teach someone else something, then I, um, I decide that I'm going to uh, use it as a teaching moment. And I think that uh, something that Giannis, I'm not going to even pronounce his last name. He's a, a player from Greece, black player. Uh, I love this kid's story, so I want to be very clear that what I'm about to talk about isn't a direct assault on him. I love this kid. I love his story. I think that he has, he's the, to me the epitome of overcoming the odds. So it's like the ideal um, uh, analogy to use his life to talk about a statement he made that uh, I understand, but I don't agree with, and here is what I'm going to give you. So, not only is he one of the best players, a former most valuable player, uh, one of the most unstoppable forces in the league, extremely athletic, skilled, and getting even better, um, He his team was the number one seed in the league, meaning that they had the best record, not just in their division, not just in their conference, but in the entire NBA, meaning that if they would have continued winning, they would have had home court advantage, advantage throughout the playoffs all the way into uh, the finals. Unfortunately, they ran into a Miami Heat team, which was the eighth seed uh, that was just on another level and even with one of their top players being injured with a fractured hand and not being able to complete the series jimmy butler uh their best player was on a whole nother level a whole nother plan he had a 56 point game and a bunch of other 30 and 40 point games and he just willed his team to win um and they ran into a team at a time that when they weren't ready to play, whatever the situation was, you can give all kind of reasons why they didn't win. You can give the fact that Giannis hurt his back in the second game uh, and was out for a game and came back and uh, contributed, but maybe he, something wasn't right. Whatever it is, it happens. Uh, and I'm not going to take away from any of the challenges that they face because life happens. And I want to be very clear here. Um the, a reporter asked Giannis, uh, being that they were the number one seed, uh, do does he consider this year a failure? And his response was, he, he, he became defensive and his response was, he doesn't consider it a failure. And he used Michael Jordan as an analogy. And Michael Jordan is the grand standard, regardless of all the debates and everything. Everybody is measured against this dude. 
and he says Michael Jordan was in the league for 15 years he only won six championships so I take it that uh, the other uh, nine years were a failure um, and in one way it was he failed to win championships those years and I think that's the thing that we've got to get away we're so afraid to acknowledge failure that we'll go out of our way to pretend that it doesn't happen and here's the real truth failure happens failure happens as individuals failures happens in failures happen uh, in business, failures happen in relationships and marriages, failures happen as parents, and failures happen in our profession environment, which his happens to be basketball. The idea isn't that you don't fail. The idea is that when you fail, you learn from your failure, you let it fuel you. So if we're going to use Michael Jordan as an analogy, then we say, okay, for a certain amount of time, Mike couldn't get there he was running in the butt saws like the lakers and the, the celtics and the pistons and what you find though in each of those years where he got knocked out of the playoffs number one he showed up you got to understand that the number one scoring performance in nba history in in the playoffs is doc is michael jordan 63 points against boston a game in early in his career where uh the great Larry Bird said it's it's just like God decided he wanted to play basketball and come down. This dude did whatever he wanted to. And it, 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 it's obvious at that point that it's a team sport because as far as he was concerned, he was definitely the best player on the court at that time. And yet what you find is every offseason, Mike worked. He was motivated. He got bigger. He got stronger. When he ran into Detroit, when he knocked off, he finally got through Boston. And now he's at Detroit. He's realizing, okay, now these guys are going to rough me up. So he put on some more weight, got stronger in the gym, came back, and eventually he got through that, and then he didn't lose again. He lost one year in the playoffs. That was after coming back from retirement and only 20-something games left in the season, but came back and redeemed himself for three more championships. And he failed a lot over the course of that. So my whole, I, my thing is when I see him say that, there's this idea that if I acknowledge that there's a failure, that I'm a failure. And that's not the case. Uh, the thing is, and I've said this uh, no matter what I've done, whether it's in my practice, whether it's in uh, what I do in the community, whether it's one-on-one -on -one with a client, uh, I, I have a principal policy that failure isn't final until you quit you're going to experience failure one thing that my mentor taught me early in uh my my adult life he said don't get caught up in the failures he says you're going to see a lot of them because you dream so big he says you set the mark so high that you're going to experience failure because you're not going to always hit those goals when you want to you're not going to always hit them the way you think you should some of them are going to be delayed some of them are going to be put further further back pushed back and it's going to be frustrating but understand that you will win because you fail forward and i didn't like the idea of failing forward because i didn't understand it and i had always been told that failure isn't an option and that was never made clear to me. So the very idea of acknowledging failure was 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 foreign to me and I didn't understand it. But when he explained it, he said that failing forward is sitting up and reaching for something. Say you set your goal at 100 and 100 in a certain period of time. And, you know, by what you've set, just how urgent that goal is meaning how hard you have to go every day to get there and you wake up every day and you give it everything you've got but you don't make it what you did do first and foremost is you got everything out of it you didn't leave anything on the table because you gave everything you had trying to get there so you don't have to look back and say how much did i leave on the table how much did i leave on the field how much did i not actualize you did it you actualized everything you just didn't hit the goal when you thought you would so you've advanced you failed forward now, what will happen is you'll get up and you'll regroup and you'll set another goal. And in the process of pursuing that next goal, you will eventually achieve the first one. You failed forward. 
There's absolutely nothing wrong with that because at the end of your life, you'll look up and you will have failed so far forward that nothing about your life resembles where you start. And that's the thing. I, I, I want us as individuals, I want us as a people uh, to understand that failure is going to happen. Failure is going to happen. Failure isn't something that you can elude in this life. Nobody wins every time. Nobody goes out and never meets opposition that they can't immediately and instantly overcome. So then that is immensely important in understanding how I'm going to move in life. So when I look at this kid, I understand his pain. You know, you're, you're definitely not expecting to get knocked out in the first round by the eighth seed when you are the number one seed in the entire league. You're not expecting that. Sometimes you need that type of wake up call because sometimes you don't respect the opposition. Sometimes you don't respect the challenge. Sometimes you take for granted what you think belongs to you and you walk around and so often because you don't seize the moment, because you don't go in with a complete investment and in having what it is you say you want you balk on it you miss on it you slip on it you get overtaken you get caught slipping and then you look up and you don't want to acknowledge that you didn't bring your a game you don't want to acknowledge that maybe today just wasn't my day you don't want to acknowledge that someone that in your mindset should not have been able to one up you did you don't want to acknowledge that maybe I didn't make the right decision. You don't want to acknowledge that maybe I've been handling things wrong. You don't want to acknowledge that maybe I could have done more to do X, Y, Z. So what you do is you sit up and say it wasn't a failure. And you use the failures of others to justify it. Let me tell you something. It is through my failures that I've succeeded. It's through my failures that I have grown. It's through my failures that I have evolved. It's through my failures that I have been able to learn and teach others. I am never going to sit up and shy away from the fact that I'm imperfect. I'm never going to sit up and shy away from the real truth that there's still so much I must learn in this life. I'm not trying to present this image of perfection or that I never lose. I'm trying to tell you that I win because I refuse to quit. We as a people are going to have to understand that because I think a lot of what we do, do in the way of becoming frustration, frustrated is this idea that something belongs to us, this idea that something is owed to us, this idea that this just should not be happening to us is, is, this, is, is the foundational focal point on which we rest our hopes. And it, it, it's not that things aren't owed to us. There are things that are owed to us generationally. There are things that are owed to us because things we deal with and go through right now today. Uh, it, it, it's not that there are things that aren't happening to us that shouldn't be happening. Uh, it is. There are things that are being done to us that shouldn't be done. There are things we're facing we shouldn't have to face. And on the surface, those things because they shouldn't be and those things we should have because they're owed to us are all real. But we can't rest our hopes on what we don't control. What I can control is how I carry myself. What I can control is what I in, uh, invest my time, energy, effort, and focus in. What I can control is practices and behaviors. What I can control is how I treat the people in my community. What I can control is how I handle black women. What I can control is how much energy I invest in black youth. What I can control is how much energy and time I put into researching and understanding the black enigma so that solutions can be created uh, from the the problems that are observed. What I don't do is sit around going, well, you did this to us. You need to fix it. Accountability and responsibility is the play of the game. Accountability is saying, look, you know, going back to uh, Giannis, 
the accountability is we didn't we didn't play good enough to win. It's that simple. Whether you feel you played your best or not is a, a, a conversation you have with yourself and your teammates. You don't have to go out and throw your teammates under the bus. You don't have to go out and say, hey, man, I sucked, unless you want to. If, if you feel like as the leader and as the best player on the team, you want to cover your teammates and you say, man, I could have done more, then you say that. But what you can say is we didn't play good enough to win this series. We will be back. I will be back. I will be better. I've seen this happen. I've seen the accountability. And a lot of sports people do not like this dude uh, for whatever reasons. He definitely didn't uh, pan out to be a great pro, but he was an unbelievable college a a athlete. Um, Tim Tebow, I remember uh, them starting off a season and they were ranked, I believe, number one. And I think they lost a game. They may have even lost two. And I remember him in a... Um, in an interview and I don't remember the exact words, but I remember him saying, Hey, we haven't played the way we should play. I haven't played the way I should play, but you will never see a per person work harder. You will never see a person more committed. I can't guarantee you we're going to win a championship, but you will never see a person work harder. You never see a person show up and play as hard. And he just went on these things that he was going to guarantee that he was going to do that were in his control. And they ended up winning the freaking championship. It is amazing what accountability does. Accountability, number one, is it's so powerful. Why? It takes the power away from all the things you want to blame about where you're at. And it places the ability and the capacity to change it squarely on your shoulders. Now, it's not a comfortable thing. It's easy to place the blame. It's easy to talk about who hurt you. It's easy to talk about who did X, Y, Z. It's easy to talk about all these things. But at the end of the day, none of that is in your control. You may never get the apology that you think you expect. You may never get the person who harmed you in whatever stage of your life to come to you and say, you know what? I was absolutely wrong and I was sorry. You may never get the U.S. government to give you reparations in your lifetime. You may never sit up and, and see a level playing field in, 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 in academics, a level playing field in corporate America, and on and on. You may not see these things, but what you can do is sit up and say that despite these things, I'm going to be the best version of myself. I'm going to be the most prepared person. I'm going to be the most studied and researched person. I'm going to focus on the solution and not the problem. And what you're going to find is that you're going to be more impactful. You're going to leave a larger legacy. You're going to have more of um, an influence on everything that's going on and everything that's happening because you are in a place of power. Power does not come from blame. Power comes from responsibility and accountability. Again, I'm not I'm not taking shots at this kid. This is number one. He's a kid. And I think that in a world where we're ready to throw everybody to the wolves at 18, you look at somebody in their 20s and you go, oh, man, you know, he's man. There's so much that I didn't know at his age. There's so much I didn't know in my 30s. It's so much I'm still learning in my mid fifties. And so what, what I want to want to say is I, I get his pain and his hurt because he's feeling, man, this is another year. We got a real good chance to go win another chip. He's won one. So we got a chance to go win another chip. And all of a sudden you're out in the first round. No one wants to feel like they were defeated by someone they should have beaten it, but it happens in sports it happens in business. It happens in life. Sometimes, personally, we get taken. But what, 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 what's going to determine the outcome of your life isn't whether you got taken. It isn't whether you got exploited. It isn't whether you got mishandled. It isn't whether you feel like things should have went your way and it didn't. It's what you do about it. We spend way too much time sitting up and talking about what's wrong and very little time invested in solving and bringing about solutions. And because we don't bring about solutions, because we don't go the extra mile, because we don't sit up and come together and put our minds together in think tanks, because we don't sit up and actually start to develop a mindset about wealth, complaining about the racial wealth gap widening isn't going to change until we change our relationship with money. It's that simple. That's one of the reasons I created the Legacy Wealth Academy is to provide the instruments for those who want to change their lives and the outcomes, now, not only for themselves, but for their progeny, their offspring, those who follow them. That's a responsibility we all hold. 
We need to work harder on socializing our youth. We need to work harder on educating our youth. And remember what I told you both in the miseducation of black youth and in academic apartheid. I told you that education is a holistic reality, a holistic uh, response, a holistic responsibility. And it, in, it, it, it encompasses not simply the attainment of academic skills, but the empowerment and preparation of our youth to grow up and go out as an adults into a world that's inherently hostile towards them and not only compete, but win. So it's not simply giving them skills it's giving them the mindset it's giving them the awareness it's giving them the understanding of self at a level that they have the confidence necessary to go out and stand on their square when everybody's trying to tell them that they aren't what they are the greatest level of education is the education of self the understanding of who you are where you come from why you're capable why you're here and if you get an understanding of those things, then you're able to withstand the forces that push against you that tell you you are not. So many of us are operating in a space that isn't where we belong because somebody told us it was. We had dreams at one point in time, but someone says, that's not you. You're not capable of doing that. You're, 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 you're overreaching. You need to reel it in a bit, little bit. Stop daydreaming. Get your head out the clouds and be realistic. And we bought into it. And we're miserable and, and we, we, we're frustrated and we don't know why because we're not operating in the fullness of who we are because we didn't properly educate ourselves. We didn't properly become acquainted with who we are in, in, at the deepest, most spiritual level, at, 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 the, at the level and the base of our gifting. We decided to buy into the notion that what they said was golden. It's okay to fail. What isn't okay is accepting failure as being final. So my challenge is to everyone out there, own your failures, but be inspired and motivated by them. Determine that this will not happen again. And then do everything in your power to become the person that's capable of ensuring that it doesn't. That's growth. That's power. That needs to be done on a collective level. And if we do that on a collective level, we can't be touched. So I hope that I was able to share something with you. I hope that, you know, it hit home. Uh, I'm going to get ready to get off of here. Uh, I need to get something in my stomach. But I just needed to stop by here. I needed to share with you guys where I sit on this thing. And um, again, like I said, I love sports. I'm a former athlete, so I love sports. I love the competitive nature. Uh, a great deal of my competitive drive comes from playing sports early in life and just this unyielding desire to be at the top of my game and win. Uh, and you learn early that there's going to be somebody better than you. And you can either be intimidated or you can strive to be the best you can. You may never get to the point where you beat that person. That's the reality for most people. It can only be one person that's the best. But striving to beat the best can make you pretty good. Striving to let the best know you exist. See, you don't have to be the best but if you're good enough that the best acknowledges, man, that dude's a problem. Then you're better than 99%. And you can do a whole lot with being the, in the top one percentile. And so the goal is to find your space. And when you find your space, you're not going to find a whole lot of people better than you when you're on your game. Because that's where you belong. Problem is, it's easy to find people better than you when you're not operating in your space. <laughs> So on that note, I am going to get out of here uh, again. I wish you the best. Also, as I said at the beginning of this, if you believe in the work we're doing, 
uh, at the Odyssey Project, at the Black Voice, Black Men Lead, and so many of others of other projects we do for the inner city, the Black inner city communities. Go to the description box at the top of the box and choose the way that you will donate and give and support the work we do. On that note, I'm out of here. Thank you guys for letting me have 25 minutes of your time. A little over 25, but thank you. Yeah, yeah. They said I should give it up like that just ain't good enough. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time you know outside of the businesses that i run like myriad business solutions the visionetics institute odyssey media group i also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in houston dallas and other areas uh, i'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the odyssey project is doing in the inner cities uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.